Bones part A is all anatomy. Bones part B has a lot to do with how a bone develops um, and some pathology that happens to bones, such as fractures and different bone diseases. So we're going to start from the beginning at the zygote right here. So sperm and egg get together and we form a single cell called a zygote. And that one single cell is going to go through division. One becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes 16, 16 becomes 32. You get the idea. And all this is happening in just the first uh, couple of days of formation. It's going to migrate to the uterine lining. Um, it's going to change a lot, AP2 material, but it's going to end up setting up house in the uterine lining. So this is the uterine lining right here, and this is that little bundle of cells. What's going to happen is that bundle of cells, part of them, is going, to, the bundle of cells is going to move to one side. And at this one side, they're going to create layers. So um, each layer is going to be called a germ layer. So one of them is called an ectoderm, another one's called a mesoderm, and another one's called the endoderm. And this picture right here is showing basically the ectoderm is going to become your epidermis. But it's also going to become your nervous system. Those two things aren't even the same, are they? But that's the way it goes. That mesoderm is going to become your connective tissue and a few other things. And then the endoderm is going to do the endocrine system and some other things. Don't worry about all those details. But we pointed out that um, the connective tissue all is derived from the mesoderm. So that middle layer, the mes mesoderm. So although the mesoderm is going to become different things, the part that is going to be mesenchyme, mesenchyme is essentially embryonal connective tissue. So it's going to become the connective tissue parts. So bone develops um, by a process called ossification. So embryonically, at two months, we're going to start to have bone develop in that embryo. So I'm talking about in the uterus, right? Um, so once that baby comes out, it's, it's got bones, but it's also got a lot of soft spots, right? It's got a lot of cartilage, and that bone growth needs to continue after the baby is born, so postnatal bone growth and until early adulthood. So women stop growing or females stop growing younger than men. Men will do uh, some sprouting even uh, late into high school and e maybe even after. Now bones are alive. So they're constantly being remodeled and repaired all your life. So you're going to replace your skeleton once approximately every 10-ish years. This picture right here is showing just some differences. So this is a, a knee joint here on a child. This is a child. Notice these big gaps. So this is the epiphysis right here and the epiphysis right here. Epiphysis of the femur, epiphysis of the tibia. Look here, here's the epiphysis right here of the adult, right there. Big difference, epiphysis of the adult right there. So it looks a lot different. Look at the difference in these. It's just amazing. But we need that. We're gonna have bone development thanks to chondrocytes going through multiplication and thanks to some certain cells in our bones that are going to deposit um, osteoid which is going to harden into bone. 
So how are we going to do this ossification, this formation of bone? Well, there's two different ways. One, and the most common, is endochondral ossification. Most of our bones do this, and that's that simple, um, we have a hyaline cartilage model, and we're going to replace it with bone. The other kind is not so common. This is going to be the bones of the skull and the clavicles. Why are those clavicles weirdos? I don't know. But especially the flat bones of the skull are going to go intramembranous ossification. The difference is there is no cartilage model on that. This is mesenchyme that's going to directly become bone. We don't have the hyaline cartilage model. We're going to have mesenchyme go straight to bone for intramembranous ossification. So this is a lot of words right here, but look, it says forms all bones inferior to the base of the skull except clavicles. Okay, so I just told you intramembranous ossification is the skull and the clavicles. Boom. I also told you this is going to happen in about month two in the embryo. So we're talking about what's going on in the uterus. And I've told you it's going to be from a hyaline cartilage model. And what's going to happen is that hyaline cartilage is going to go through um, the hyaline cartilage is end up going to be replaced by bone. So it's going to start in the center of what we would think of as the doggy bone because most of the bones that are below the skull are fairly long. Right? So it's going to start in the center of the, of the bone. I have a picture if that's um, confusing. But we're going to have um, some osteoblasts come in and get the ball rolling by secreting that osteoid. And that osteoid is going to harden. Um, remember, mesenchyme is embryonal connective tissue. And it's going to directly become osteoblasts. So picture number one, we've got this bone. And I'm telling you, the primary center of ossification is going to be kind of in the middle. So we're going to have a blood vessel. Remember, blood is a connective tissue. came from mesenchyme. So it's going to meet up in the center of that bone, in the uh, center of that little, I guess I should say, hyaline cartilage thing that looks like a bone. <laughs> and put in the tiniest amount of bone and getting things started. So it's going to create this collar of bone around that hyaline cartilage. Then what's going to happen is that cartilage is going to get hard. It's going to calcify. And uh, the center is going to start to die, causing a, a pocket, a cavity. Okay, now... So again, mesenchyme, we're in the embryo. We got a lot of mesenchyme, which is embryonal connective tissue. It's going to differentiate into different things. So one thing embryonal connective tissue, mesenchyme can differentiate to is periosteum. So we're gonna get some periosteum with that new bone and what's gonna also come from the mesenchyme is going to be blood vessels. Remember, periosteum has some blood vessels, and they're going to penetrate into that new bony collar, go into that cavity, and it's going to start to form spongy bone. So at birth, that diaphysis, the shaft, has gotten pretty darn long, and we have what you would think of as a, a diaphysis. And we're going to have a small medullary cavity. The cavity is not big like an adult. Also, some of those blood vessels are going to be on uh, depositing a new bony area, so a secondary ossification center, on the ends of the bones. So... Um, this is why when you looked at that x-ray earlier, the, the child's epiphysis is so tiny. Because that's the secondary ossification center. 
And then what we're going to have in the end, at ch from childhood to adolescence, is that cartilage area is going to get smaller and smaller, and the secondary ossification center is going to get bigger and bigger. Now notice on this picture, we still have an epiphyseal plate, right? Because this is how bones are going to grow in length. So this is just showing how we have made a long bone from an embryo to an adolescent and the changes. So this would be, this would be a baby right here. And we're going to have, you know, of course, that baby's finger is going to get bigger and bigger. So the toddler, even, this area is going to be a little bit bigger right? It's going to keep getting bigger. But all of the blue is still going to be hyaline cartilage. So this in a nutshell is showing uh, a different picture of all of the same information. And this is all those little chondrocytes and they're going to end up dying, getting replaced by bone. We're going to keep that epiphyseal plate and we're going to go through those regions here in a little bit of the epiphyseal plate. But we're, mesenchyme is embryonal connective tissue and it's going to differentiate into every kind of connective tissue that we talked about. So uh, blood and uh, cartilage and bone and periosteum and perichondrium. You get the idea. Okay, intermembranous is when we're going to take that um, mesenchymal tissue, so that mesenchyme, and we're going to make it straight into bone. So that mesenchyme is going to differentiate into clusters of osteoblasts. So we're going to we're going to go straight to bone on this one. We don't need a hyaline cartilage model. We're going to make some osteoblasts. So mesenchyme differentiates into osteoblasts. And what do osteoblasts do? Secretes osteoid. So when those osteoblasts secrete osteoid, it attracts calcium, and that area is going to get hard. So now that osteoblast has been trapped, he's going to change from a blast cell to a site cell. So we've got these osteocytes that are now trapped, but that's okay because remember we had osteocytes in the long bones too that you looked at in lab inside those osteons. They're going to be the regulators that recognize what needs to be done to that bone. We still got some uh, some mesenchyme hanging around, right? We still got that fibrous connective tissue. And what it's going to do is it's going to uh, start to also create that periosteum that we need for those busy, busy cells that are going to build up and break down bone. It's going to make some blood vessels because mesenchyme is undifferentiated connective tissue, so it can differentiate into blood. So we're going to have some blood vessels that are going to go into our newly created bone and weave in and out of the different areas of the empty parts of the centers. Now on the outside, we're going to end up replacing um, some of that uh, immature spongy bone by compact bone, so it's going to start to harden. We're going to keep that a soft spongy bone in the middle. So remember our goal is to make a spongy bone sandwich for the bones of the skull. And so the outer part of this bone, that mesenchymal tissue will develop into compact bone, but the inner part's gonna stay the same. Okay, so that was embryonal growth. Now the baby's born, so postnatal, after being born, we got to still grow. Look at that cute little fingers right there, holding on to that big finger right there. We've got to grow in length, and we have to grow in width, right? So growing in length is called interstitial growth. 
that's growing in length. And the way we're going to use it is those growth plates, the epiphyseal plates. So right here, we're showing that epiphyseal plate right there. The reason it's black on um, an x-ray is because it's not, it's cartilage. It's not calcified. It doesn't have minerals in it. And so bone shows up amazingly and metal too, by the way, on an x-ray because it's got so many minerals in it. So cartilage is not mineralized, so it shows up black on an x-ray. Remember, x-rays are great at seeing mineralized things. Chapter one. As a matter of fact, cartilage is going to go away. Cartilage, so on a human skeleton, let's say, you know, you find some ancient uh, burial ground, the cartilage is all gone. That's why you'll never find a full shark. You'll only find his teeth. Sharks are all cartilage. Okay, so our growth, our interstitial growth is growth in length, and that's going to be because of the growth plates. Growth in width is called appositional growth. So we had those, that cellular layer of the periosteum, and we had the cells on the endosteum. Those are going to be the guys that are going to make us grow in width. In the epiphyseal plate, what's going to go through mitosis is the cartilage, right? Because that's what the epiphyseal plate is, cartilage. And usually once you're sexually mature, you stop growing, except some of your facial bones will keep growing. So right here, I have the epiphyseal plate. Um, it consists of five um, five zones. So what I did was I highlighted where the epiphyseal plate was and I drew in here where the, I don't know where that red line came from though, sorry. Um, I drew in where the resting zone is. It's closest to the epiphysis and where the ossification zone is. It's closer to the diaphysis. So we're going to have bone invasion on the ossification side. So lots of words, but the resting zone is called the resting zone because not much happens there. But in the proliferation zone, that's where we're going to have um, the chondrocytes are going to be going through mitosis. And those cells are going to be moving upward, pushing the epiphysis away from the shaft of the bone, causing lengthening. The next zone, hypertrophic zone, what's going to happen is those chondrocytes that uh, were going through mitosis, they're going to start to get bigger and fatter, and their mitosis is going to slow down. Um, their little lacunae are going to start to go away, and we're going to end up having these little spaces where um, chondrocytes are connected to each other, so they're sharing lacuna. The next zone is where we're going to start to get that cartilage is going to start to attract some calcium. And when it attracts some calcium, the chondrocytes start to die. And any of those little calcified spikes are going to be uh, going into the ossification zone. So those little spikes are going to be broken down by osteoclasts and being replaced by osteoblasts. So remember, we have a lot of mesenchyme, a lot of mesenchymal tissue with a lot of differentiation. Mesenchyme can become all kinds of things, osteoblasts, osteoclasts. Eventually, the goal is going to be replacing a large portion of the spongy bone, not all of it but a large portion of it. And in the medullary area, that cavity is going to get wider. It's going to tunnel out with that erosion. So here's those zones blown up on an x-ray with some beautiful dye. Now, as we get older, we're not going to go through as much mitosis. Everything's going to start to slow down. All of this is mostly under the influence of hormones. So um, we're going to have 
less division. And as we have less division, that epiphyseal plate's going to get thinner and thinner. And because as division slows down, we're going to end up with um, more bone deposition in those areas and less cartilage being made. Eventually, the epiphysis and the diaphysis will fuse, and so the epiphyseal plate will no longer exist. Cartilage will be gone, and it's going to be replaced with something called an epiphyseal line. So bones grow appositionally, potentially through life. The more a muscle pulls on a bone, the stronger that muscle gets. So those resistance training things really are good for your bone. It makes stronger bone. This picture shows appositional bone growth from an infant to an adult. So obviously that bone is a lot wider, right, on the adult. So what's happening here is that that periosteum, remember there is the uh, fibrous layer on the outside, the cellular layer on the inside. The periosteum has some osteoblasts that are laying down bone on the outside of that compact bone. But on the inside of that bone, so in here, is the endosteal layer. And the guys that are working for appositional growth on that bone are the osteoclasts. <clears throat> so the osteoclasts are sitting there shaving down the inside of the bone, but it's okay because you have osteoblasts laying down bone on the outside. So as the guys on the outside are laying out new bone, the guys on the inside are shaving down bone, and so the center is going to get wider and wider, and the outside is going to get wider and wider. In the end, let's look at this difference of a child to an adult. So the child has that epiphyseal plate that's going to be cartilage on the left. Its epiphysis is smaller and actually has a, quite a bit of red bone marrow, and so does the medullary cavity. The medullary cavity does have some compact bone, but it still has quite a bit of red bone marrow, really not much yellow marrow at all. So eventually what's going to happen is at the periosteum, you're going to have some osteoblasts laying down bone and on the inside in the marrow area at the endosteum, you're going to have osteoclasts shaving down the middle. That red bone marrow with it, any spongy areas that are left in there is going to turn into yellow bone marrow as an adult. So we're going to keep some areas of red bone marrow as an adult, but we don't have nearly as much red marrow as children. So here's a picture of the red marrow where, as an adult, where we have red marrow. So if you need to do a uh, bone marrow aspirate to find out whatever somebody um, are they a bone marrow match or does somebody have bone marrow cancer whatever these are great places to get a sample from so we can see them at the um, epiphysis of the femur and the humerus we also have it at our um, most of our pelvis as a matter of fact the ilium up here at this wing right here would be a great place to get a sample right there. Also our ribs, our vertebrae, our skull. I don't want anybody drilling into my skull just to get a bone marrow sample though, do you? Let's say for some reason your bone marrow has been destroyed. Maybe radiation um, because you're a cancer patient or maybe because you have a, um, a bone marrow donor that's going to uh, give you good blood because you are a sickle cell patient. Anyway, these harvested cells, it's amazing, are usually going to be injected. So again, these are bone marrow cells that have been taken from a donor from, you know, one of those areas I just pointed out, usually the iliac crest. But um, 
they're going to be injected into a vein of the person that needs them. And it's crazy. It knows how to get to the bone marrow. And then forever and ever, the receiver's DNA is going to say that they're that person that donated. Isn't that crazy? It's amazing and miraculous. Hormones that help regulate um, bone growth. Uh, growth hormone and thyroid hormone very much work together to ensure um, that epiphyseal plate is um, stimulated to grow. And then that growth spurt that happens in teenage years is going to be sex hormones. So those testosterone for male, estrogen for women, the hormones that everybody thinks of, right? Here's a clinical view, a chondroplastic dwarfism. So there's different kinds of dwarfisms. This one is uh, got a genetic link where for some reason, we're not going to have normal chondrocyte growth. So they're not going to do their mitosis and enlargement and pushing the epiphysis up away from the um, diaphysis. They're not going to do that. So long bones don't grow right. They don't grow long. Now the torso is going to be usually a normal size and the head is going to be a normal size. So notice like here's a couple of achondroplastic dwarfs and their torso is just a little bit shy of height of these other people here, these normal statured people. We don't think about our bone constantly changing, but it is. Gravity is making us uh, get tiny little, tiny, tiny, tiny micro fissures inside of our bone. And that actually makes it healthy. Just like um, exercising, strength, strength training. You're pulling with your muscles on your bones. And you're actually creating this remodeling process where we have areas of bone that get slightly shaved down wherever we have the tiniest crack by the osteoclasts. And then the osteoblasts are going to come and lay down some fresh osteoid, which remember is the organic part, the colloid part. And um, then it's going to attract the inorganic part, the calcium salts. So this is happening all the time in your bones each and every day. And our bones get replaced about every nine to 10 years. Spongy bone even more frequently than that because it's, re it's receiving all the stress. Uh, we do have parathyroid hormone that is going to help the macrophages. I'm going to show you that in the next slide. But here's the thing. Sometimes... We're going to have resorption from the osteoclast just because we have a crack. Just remodeling each and every day. And then the osteoblasts are going to come and deposit new bone. But sometimes our bloodstream says, hey, I'm really low on calcium. And we must have calcium in our bloodstream to fire neurons, to allow blood to clot, or to have um, our muscles contract super important cation. So if it's low, parathyroid is going to be the guy that recognizes that. So that's the next slide. So that if our body says, hey, I don't have enough calcium in my blood to do these things, the parathyroid hormone is going to be released by the parathyroid gland and tell those osteoclasts to get busy. Go shave on the bone so that I can have more calcium released from my bone and it gets put into the blood. Uh, we'll get into calcitonin AMP2. Um, also, whenever we have mechanical stress, so if you use your right hand all the time, maybe your um, work at some sort of field job, maybe like plumbers are using their hands all the time uh, with a wrench, or a welder or whatever, some sort of physical job that you're always using your dominant hand. 
and with that you're also using those muscles in that hand they're constantly pulling on the bone and so wolf's law says that we're going to make that bone remodeled thicker to help withstand that um, increased muscle tension on that side same thing with strength training your muscles are when you do strength training it is physically making your bones thicker and stronger and the reason that we should do strength training when we're young so that when we're old we don't have as fragile of bones this slide is showing how parathyroid hormone works does just to keep us in balance we must have calcium we must have calcium we must have calcium so if the body recognizes my calcium blood level is too low that's going to tell the parathyroid hormone to be released to tell the osteoclast to start shaving on some of that bone this is showing how uh, wolf's law works so um, we're going to have stressors on it that's going to make that bone thicker um, to resist any problems with all those routine stresses in a nutshell here's something else about calcium so I've already said you must have calcium to con to contract your muscles to fire your neurons to clot your blood and here's something else that if you put calcium in your mouth but your vitamin D levels are low in your blood you can't absorb that it's one of the reasons that vitamin D milk I mean that that milk is fortified with vitamin D and it's another reason that calcium supplements like Caltrate aren't just calcium they're also vitamin D look at these things that can happen to you if your calcium levels get out of whack so if your blood calcium levels are too low you actually go through these spastic spells like the um, kid that got stung by the black widow remember the calcium rushed into the neuron and he started getting muscle cramping and, and seizure type activity too high of calcium you can actually get non-responsive and I'll tell you if blood calcium levels actually get too too high you can go into heart failure fulminant heart failure and die so vitamin D important to absorb your calcium it's not in very many foods it's in mushrooms by the way if you like mushrooms you should be good but it's added to milk it's added to orange juice um, and the best way is just go outside when you go outside your skin is going to get started on making a vitamin D precursor which is eventually going to be broken down by the liver into a new form and then the final usable form is going to be created by a breakdown recreation in the kidneys so let's talk about fractures first of all some people will say well she didn't have a break she just had a little crack that's a break <laughs> so anything that has a line in it any type of bones got a line in it that's a fracture so in young people that's usually from trauma but in older people it's usually because of muscle weakness or maybe some sort of pathology with the bone such as osteoporosis so here's how they're classified um, they can be displaced or non-displaced so if you just get a crack and everything's still in perfect alignment that's non-displaced um, in your lab book we talk about complete or incomplete so incomplete it's a crack that doesn't go all the way through the bone but nonetheless it's a crack it's a fracture and then uh, in the lab book this is also pointed out there's open and closed fractures so an open fracture the bone is sticking out of the skin somehow um, another name for it is a compound fracture a closed fracture is just that you can tell usually that a bone is broken because there's bruising and such but um, uh, maybe some swelling or maybe you can see the bump under the skin but that's called a closed fracture or also called a simple fracture this I think just kind of summarizes up everything kind of nice and I have actually starred those things that are in the lab book 
I want to point out that a spiral fracture usually comes from a twisting action. And so if a spiral fracture, if a child has a spiral fracture and goes to a children's hospital, it's just automatic that the parents are investigated. It doesn't mean that the parents are abusing the child, but that the twisting action of being too rough on a child can cause a spiral fracture. And um, so it needs to be investigated to be sure that everything's okay. So there you go. These are basic, simple and compound fracture it just means that it is either sticking out of the skin or it's not. Um, another name for simple is closed. Another name for compound is open. Transverse fracture is just like you learned with the planes. It just goes straight across. Spiral fracture, it's got a spiral to it, like a spiral staircase. Comminuted means it's more than one, one, more than one piece. An impacted fracture is very common in a vertebrae, so I'll explain that. So if you think about a vertebrae, you know, it uh, kind of looks like a, a disc in a way. It looks like a thick cylinder. And what will happen with an um, impaction fracture is that maybe uh, you fall down on your bum and you jar your back. The top part of your vertebrae collapses onto the bottom part of your vertebrae. Green stick gets that name because it looks like what would happen if you grab a branch off of a tree and the branch is alive, but you twist the branch. The branch doesn't snap in half because the inside is all green. It's a green stick. So it'll split along the bark and you can see the lines and you can even see the inside. You can see all the green stuff, but it's not a, it's not a complete break and it is... Um, often got a piece of a splinter sticking out like the bark splintering. An oblique fracture is similar to a spiral, but a lot of times it's just a line that's going from one side to the other side in a diagonal, but doesn't continue around like a uh, spiral staircase. So what do you do about it? Well, you reduce it. If you don't have to actually use any sort of metal put inside the bone, so in other words, you just use a cast, uh, that's closed reduction. So maybe the person gets sedated or not, and the physician puts everything exactly how it's supposed to be, wraps it up in some casting, well, that's a closed reduction. If you have to have do surgery where you do a pin or wire or a plate, that's an open reduction. The goal is to not have that bone moving. So if after it's, it's all set, after it's been reduced, if that bone still can freely turn on itself, like with a transverse fracture, then it's not gonna heal. So there's different ways to, to, to repair different fractures because it, it must be immobilized. Simple fractures, so just you know, a closed fracture, uh, just a single line is going to be the easiest to heal, especially if you're young. A compound fracture, when it once it leaves the skin, remember that your skin is your primary defense to the outside world. So once that happens, you've in, invited the outside world into your body. So that's going to slow down healing. Um, it's where antibiotics are going to come into play because we don't want that, of course, any of those cooties to infect our bone marrow. That's a pretty important part of your body. Open fracture. I want to introduce a pathological fracture. So I mentioned this like as old people, you know, the bone gets thinner and so the, things just don't work as good as they used to when you're older. But what if you have a disease? And I used osteoporosis as an example. But here's another example. You can appreciate on this right here. Something's going on here. Something is not right. That bone is being eaten away 
and the body's trying to fix it in this area right here this little starburst appearance is trying to lay down new bone but there's even little these little it's called a moth eaten appearance even inside the new bone so what was normal like this should have been coming down like this this started getting eaten away and so the body said, oh, I'll fix it. I'll create a bridge, just like it would if your bone was broken. But whatever is causing this is putting holes in the new stuff, too. This is osteosarcoma. That's a cancer. So sometimes you can get a fracture because of disease, whether it's cancer or osteoporosis. And that's called a pathological fracture. Okay. How do we heal a bone? Well, here's the four major steps. The first one, obviously, is you're going to bleed. Whether you've broken the skin or not, there's bleeding somewhere because bone is very bloody. And so that's going to form a hematoma, which is like a big blood clot. Then we're going to have something called a fibrocartilaginous callus. That's going to become a bony callus. And then finally, at the bony callus formation, it's all healed, but it's got a bump on it. So then we have to remodel it, just like with the last time. We're going to have some osteoclasts come in, shave down the bump, osteoblasts laying down the smooth bone. So here's some pictures. Well, this isn't a picture, but <laughs> this is a little bit more detail. So hematoma, you tore some blood vessels because the bone is very vascular and it gets swollen and painful and inflamed and you can usually see something happened right there part two fibrocartilaginous callus formation is we're gonna so we have this hematoma it's going to turn into a great big blood clot macrophages are going to come and start cleaning it up wait a minute i'm not supposed to have a blood clot right here and capillaries are going to grow to that area to bring healing factors in so your vessels can actually grow all the time every time we add a little bit of fat onto our body vessels are going to grow it's it it's uh happening all the time okay so with that um with the macrophage cleaning up fibroblasts are going to come in and start to secrete some collagen fibers to go from point A to point B of the fracture. So you've got whatever, a four centimeter, well, that'd be big, four millimeter gap between one end of the broken bone and the other. Fibroblasts are going to secrete those pink fibers to connect point A to point B. And then we're going to have other cells come in and just start to reconstruct lots of details. But, you know, cells have a job. Each, every different cell has a different job. And we're going to start to do whatever that cell's job is to do. So like the fibroblast, fibroblast secreting collagen. The cartilage is going to start to try and create a new little growth of collagen to make it a, a little bit firmer of a connection. And osteogenic cells are going to say, hey, we've got a problem here. I'm going to make some more fibroblasts so they can lay down some osteoid. Sometimes those fibroblasts are going to get stuck in their own osteoid and become an osteocyte. You get the idea. So within a week, you're actually going to start to get these new spicules of bone, that, that trabecular bone. And... Um, What's going to happen is our fibrocartilaginous callus is going to start to be replaced by bone. So that semi-soft um, support, so, you know, the flexible support is what cartilage is. It's going to get replaced by a hard callus, a bony callus. And then again, remodeling is just making that bump go away, and that takes quite a while. Different bone disorders, you've probably heard of some of these. Um, rickets is a pretty old one, maybe you read about it in um, history, but it's coming back because you know why? Rickets starts with lack of vitamin D and nobody goes outside to play anymore. Children stay on their uh, video games and children aren't drinking as much milk. They like Coke and Dr. Pepper. Well, 
If you don't have vitamin D, you cannot absorb your calcium. And in the end, you actually will end up with some pretty darn soft bones. I'm going to go through these slides of the different bone diseases. So osteomalacia is a general term that um, it can be caused by different things, but it usually has to do something with not enough um, calcium being deposited. So you can make the organic part. You're making the osteoid, which is collagen, the most abundant protein in your body. But if you're not laying down any sort of calcium on top of it or not enough, they're going to be pretty soft bones, pretty bendable bones. Um, rickets, that one I just mentioned, it has to do with poor vitamin D. So if you don't have enough vitamin D, then you can't absorb your calcium. It could be from not having enough calcium as well, but historically it's been a vitamin D problem. These children or adults, because if you don't resolve the problem as you grow, you become an adult and you still have this problem, which was a common, a common thing a long time ago. You know, now if your children say, my bones are killing me, hopefully you're bringing your kid to the doctor and the doctor will figure it out. But, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, you know, the children are hurting and, you know, maybe mom says, oh, it's growing pains or maybe dad says, suck it up, whatever. So with time, if you don't get it fixed, you'll have permanent bowed legs. So you'll have permanent bone deformities. So osteoporosis, you know, you have these osteoclasts working all the time and they're shaving off bone. But what if we're not replacing it enough? What if we don't have enough osteoid being replaced? This is what happens with osteoporosis. It's usually postmenopausal women. There's definitely a genetic link into it too. Um, but uh, it, 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 the older you are, the more likely it is, especially with a woman. Other risk factors besides genetics, I probably should make genetics bigger. Uh, smoking. So this is what osteoporotic bone looks like down there on the bottom compared to normal. And there are treatments. They're, they're working on lots of drugs. Actually, one of them is that hormone that I kind of skipped over and I said we'll do it in... Um, AMP2, calcitonin. So there's lots of mysteries as far as, you know, parathyroid so much in charge of calcium. What exactly does calcitonin do? We're working on it. But um, now they're using it in some drugs to help treat osteoporosis. If you use your bones, if you do strength training, you're going to improve those bones. So doing it when you're young, before you have a disease, at least gets you into a senior citizen age with thicker than normal bones. And of course, you know, supplementing with calcium and vitamin D are also a good idea. And um, sometimes we'll do hormone therapy, but that's definitely up to your doctor because hormone therapy has potential to cause other problems. Best to just prevent it. Take in enough calcium, vitamin D, go outside, decrease the amount of sodas that you drink, drink more, drink more milk, and do resistance training. This guy's a weirdo. You've probably never even heard of this guy, but I don't know. Maybe you have. Um, not sure what causes it. Maybe some sort of virus that hit a person earlier in life, and you start to see the symptoms at age 40 or more. Um, so just lots of spongy bone, not so much compact bone, and just deep, just really missing a lot of the minerals in general. And this is what this looks like. Um, before I get into this, there's one thing I want to mention. A lot of times you'll hear somebody say she fell or he fell and broke a hip. Well, actually, a lot of times what happens is the hip broke as the person was walking. And so here's this person walking, and then all of a sudden, that bone just cracks, and your leg bone is holding all your weight. So if you can imagine a senior citizen that's already maybe a little unsteady on their feet, and that femur breaks, 
that neck of the femur breaks and they're down. So it's not actually, it's more common for instead of she fell and broke a hip, it's really she broke a hip so she fell. Okay, so that embryonal ossification. So from point of conception within two weeks, we're going to start to develop bone. Um, when you're born, you still have those secondary growth areas at the growth plates so that the cartilage can go through multiplication and make the bone longer. Um, but we're done at about age 25. Women usually earlier than that. Cool picture has your ossification centers at 12 weeks. So you're developing here. This is embryonic. And then I'll just end with this. As we get older, things just don't work like they used to. We start to resorb too much bone and not lay down enough bone. Men usually have a greater mass before they get old than women do. So men don't seem to have as much problems unless there's a genetic disorder like Paget's disease. And once we hit 40, everything goes to pot. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we really don't heal as well as we used to in our bones uh, after we hit 40.